Okay. So let me remind you what we were doing last time and I needed to finish up this proof. Uh, we gave this the theorem that gamma is amenable if and only if the uh, canonical star homomorphism from the full group C star algebra to the reduced group C star algebra is a star isomorphism. And uh, let's see, I sketched. So one direction uh, we needed a lemma for, which I promised I would give you this lemma. And that is that uh, if their full group and, and reduced group C star algebra are isomorphic, then the group is amenable. And that's just if, that's just because uh, the full group C star algebra always has a one-dimensional home representation. Mainly the trivial representation on the group gives you a one-dimensional representation of the full group C star algebra. So if they're isomorphic, then the reduced group C star algebra has a one-dimensional representation. But then I showed you how it, using Han Banach, you can extend this to a state on B of L2, and then restricting that to L infinity gives you an invariant mean. Uh, and at one point I used this uh, equality, I guess, right here, that on this extension, you're still multiplicative with respect to the group elements. Uh, and that's because the state uh, restricted to the group elements is a homomorphism. So I wanted to uh, prove this lemma. Uh, I stated it right here at the end. Uh, so here's the lemma that if you have a state on a C star algebra, so A here is a C star algebra with unit. And if you have a, a state on the C star algebra and you have an element of the C star algebra such that the state looks like a homomorphism on that element, uh, then it looks like a homomorphism whenever you put that element uh, multiplied by any other thing in the C star algebra. So this is the lemma we're applying. This X will be in the reduced group uh, C star algebra of gamma, and T here will be in B of L2 of gamma. That's how we apply this lemma. All right, so let me go ahead and give you a proof of this lemma. So proof. And of course, the, the best thing about uh, states is that you have a GNS representation for states on C star algebras. And then, so you just use the GNS representation and, and then the proof falls out almost immediately. Uh, so we have that uh, by the GNS construction, uh, the state B corresponds to a representation uh, pi mapping A to bounder operators on some Hilbert space H uh, and a state or and a vector, a univector and a univector C and H. So this is a cyclic representation such that B of uh, any element of the C star algebra is just the inner product of pi of A, C, C. So A and C. So that's the GNS construction. So if you're not familiar with the GNS construction, you can Google it or something. Um, so I won't give a proof for that, but it's a very easy proof and it's a very natural, natural thing used over and over and over. Uh, so this is the GNS construction. So we know that our state has this form. And then let's see what this condition that phi of x star x is equal to the absolute value of phi squared. Let's see what that gives us then. So we have that phi of x star x is then equal to pi of x star x, c, c. So this is just the norm of pi of x times c squared. Whereas if we look at what is phi of x star phi of x, well, this is just going to be equal to, now we have this, this pi of x c c, and I guess taking the adjoint, uh, so states preserve star, so it turns adjoint into complex com conjugation, so this is just the absolute value of this square. And so now we're supposing that these two things are equal. 
So therefore, what do we have? We have that therefore uh, the norm of pi of x c, uh, well, we can take the square roots, oops. We can take the square roots and so we get that this squared is, or without square, is equal to the absolute value of the inner product of pi of x c c uh, okay which is uh, less than I want to use Cauchy Schwartz now so this is pi of x c c okay something I'm not happy with uh, the X, uh, ah, no, maybe I'm I am happy with this. So what do we get? We get that um, uh, this is less than equal to this. So we get that therefore. C is norm one, so we can erase that because this is a unit vector. And uh, well, what do we get? Is that these three all have to be equal? Um, so therefore, ah, but Cauchy Schwartz says that if you have two vectors, you take their inner product, then the absolute value is equal. This forces them to be parallel, uh, parallel vectors. Um, so we get the therefore pi of x c is just equal to some alpha c or alpha a scalar. Um, specifically, alpha should be probably in the unit circle. So this is, this is what we get. Um, but uh, okay, but what does that mean? Well, that means now let's look at v of x star a and see what that is. So this is the inner product of pi of x star a x c x c. And now we can use that this as a representation, move the pi to the other side, and then put this alpha here. So this is equal to pi a c alpha c. And then of course the alpha we can pull out. So this is exactly alpha bar and then what's left over is v of a. So this is just exactly v of x, v of a, v of x bar, v of a. And then you can do a similar thing on the right with right multiplication, uh, et cetera. So that proves the lemma. All right, everybody happy with this lemma? Okay, good. Uh, so that finishes the proof that if those two C-star algebras are isomorphic, then the group is amenable. Uh, and then I also want to finish up the proof of the other way around. For that, we use the spell absorption. So this was the key tool that we were going to use, that this representation, this is true for any group, uh, that if you have any representation and you tensor it with the left regular representation, then this is unitarily equivalent to the trivial representation tensor the left regular representation. Uh, and we gave an explicit unitary, which does this. So now let me go ahead and prove this direction that amenability uh, implies that this star homomorphism from the full to the reduced C star algebra is an isomorphism. And the form of amenability we're going to take here is that the left regular representation has almost invariant vectors. And so what can we do? Well, we have this canonical homomorphism. Uh, let's take something in the kernel and I'll show it's uh, trivial. So that if this homomorphism is injective, then it's uh, an isomorphism. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's suppose some uh, T 
And the full group C star algebra is in the kernel of this homomorphism. All right, we want to hopefully show that t is equal to zero. Uh, what do we know? We know that the group algebra is dense inside of this, so we can approximate t by things in the group algebra. Uh, so we get, therefore, there exists tn in the group algebra such that t minus tn goes to zero. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix any representation. So fix a representation i, gamma to u of h, for instance, some universal representation, that's fine. Uh, and we'll fix two vectors in h, we'll fix c and eta in h. And I want to compute what is this pi t c eta? And I want to hopefully show this is zero. If this is zero, then that means that t itself is zero because of course the full group C C algebra has a faithful representation, um, which, which then proves the result. So I want to hopefully show that this is zero. Uh, so the trick here is that of course we know that this is the limit as n goes to infinity of pi t n c Eta. And now Tn, uh, for each n, Tn is just some fixed element of the group algebra. And what do we know? We know that the left regular representation has almost invariant vectors. So what we can do is we can say that this is equal to some, I guess, limit as, and we still have the limit as n goes to infinity, and then we have limit as m goes to infinity. And now we can consider the representation pi tensor, the left regular. And now we can take C tensor and then some zeta n say an eta tensor zeta n. And this is where zeta n in the left regular representation uh, is an almost invariant sequence. Being almost invariant says that when Tn is a group element, you have this, but of course, taking some fixed linear span of group elements, you also have this. Um, okay, so we have this, uh, but then on the other hand, what is this? We have Fell's absorption lemma, which I proved last time, that says that this is unitarily conjugate, pi tensor lambda is unitarily conjugate to a trivial representation tensor lambda. So this is, unitarily conjugate, well, therefore this is equal. Well, sorry about that, but I'm gonna continue this string of equalities. Here we have limit as n goes to infinity, limit as m goes to infinity, and now we have um, the trivial representation tensor lambda applied to Tn. And now we have some other vectors, um, uh, say zeta n tilde and zeta n double tilde, wherever they unitary. And all we know about these is that they have the same norm as these other vectors, so c and eta respectively. All right, so now we can take absolute values everywhere. Uh, and, and then, uh, use Cauchy-Schwartz and say that this is less than or equal to the limit as n goes to infinity, limit as m goes to infinity. Uh, oh, sorry, this, this should be an m. Oh. The second n should be an m. So this is m, this is m. And you have one m for each n. So if n is fixed, and then we're for each n, we have this sequence. Uh, actually, no, it doesn't matter. If, if the group is countable, then this is fine. If it's uncountable, take a net 
an M, and then it's fine. Okay. Uh, so now the point is, is that this is less than or equal to, we can use Cauchy-Schwartz, and we say that this is, say, the norm of one tensor lambda Tn, and then times the norm of this vector zeta tilde m, which I said was no more than the norm of C, and then the norm of this other one, which is no more than the norm of eta. So now we've dropped the m, and now we take a limit as n goes to infinity, and we see that, well, of course, t was in the kernel of this homomorphism, and so as n goes to infinity, and here we have uh, one tensor lambda, so it's equivalent to lambda itself, and so this tends to zero as well as n tends to infinity. All right, so that's that's how you prove that the kernel of this map has to be zero. Any questions about that? Okay, so there's one more equivalent uh, characterization of amenability that I wanted to give before we move on to property T. And this one has, is an application to von Neumann algebras. Uh, this is basically an observation of Schwartz, uh, Jacob Schwartz. And that's the, well, first let me give you a definition. This is due to Alan Kahn. Uh, so a, a tracial von Neumann algebra M tau uh, has, well, is amenable if there exists a hypertrace P on V of L2 of M. Uh, so I'm going to maybe not define, so I'll assume you maybe are all familiar with the basics of von Neumann algebra techniques. So trace rule von Neumann algebra just means a von Neumann algebra which has a tracial state tau. So it's a state in tau of x, y is tau of y, x, and it's also faithful. I'll always assume it's faithful. And then you can do the GNS construction, and then you get this standard representation M acting on L2 of M. And what do I mean by hypertrace? Uh, so IE, V is a state on V of L2 of M, such that uh, two things. One is that V restricts, restricted to M is the trace we started with. Okay, so if M is a factor, then it has unique trace. And so this is a vacuous statement here. And then uh, two is that uh, we have the phi of xt is equal to phi of tx for all x and m and t and bounded operators on L2 of m. So that's the definition of a hypertrace. And if there exists such a state on B of L to of M, then the von Neumann algebra is said to be amenable. Uh, so, yeah. So the terminology hypertrace comes from Alan Kahn in, in his work in the 70s. Uh, so what can we say then? So now we have the following theorem which is basically it's before Alan Kahn, but the terminology wasn't. Uh, and that is that uh, a group gamma is amenable if and only if L gamma, which let me just remind you is the um, von Neumann algebra generated by the left regular representation Uh, is amenable. Uh, and finally, let me also remind you, so L gamma here 
This is the von Neumann algebra generated by the left regular representation. And let me remind you that it, it uh, is a tracial von Neumann algebra and it has a canonical trace, which I'll always assume. Uh, so the trace on this is given by the vector state x, Dirac function at the identity, Dirac function at the identity. And if you haven't done it before, it's a fun exercise to see that this state uh, on L gamma is indeed a normal faithful tracial state. Okay. All right. So let's give a proof of this. Uh, so let's see, there are two directions to prove. Uh, let's go ahead and prove this direction first. So let's see, what can we do here? Yeah, so here's one way to do it. There's, so there's a number of ways to do it. And uh, a, fun, a fun thing to do when you're bored sometimes is to think, how can you show two things, uh, two equivalent notions of amenability are equivalent. And there's about a uh, hundred different uh, equivalent notions of amenability. And each two of them, you have about a hundred different proofs for. So here's my proof of the day, the proof du jour for this implication. Uh, so what we can do is we consider, uh, so gamma x on the states. Uh, so we consider the following set. So consider, I'll call it script S. So this is the set of states on uh, B of L2 of gamma that extend the canonical trace on L gamma. All right, so we know by Han Banach this is non-empty. Uh, and moreover, uh, this is a weak star closed subset of the state space uh, because of course, being equal to the canonical trace on L gamma is a closed condition. So this is a weak star compact set. So a weak star compact set. We also have that the group acts on this set. So gamma acts on this S by conjugation with the left regular representation. So the left regular representation gives you unitaries and B of L2. And so then you act on B of L2 by conjugation and you also act on the state space the same way. Uh, so here we have, and this is of course, yeah. So here we have an uh, action. So this is also an affine space. I should have mentioned that. So this is weak star compact set and this is all convex. That's the other thing that's obvious. And this action by conjugation is a corpse by affine maps. So therefore we have an action of gamma on a weak star compact convex set uh, by affine homeomorphisms. And one of the equivalent characterizations of amenability that we proved is that therefore there's a fixed point. So since gamma is amenable, there is a fixed point All right, so this is a state on B of L2. Uh, it restricts to the trace and it uh, is invariant under conjugation. So I claim that this is the hyper trace for a gamma. So, uh, so note that, uh, well, I think we're, we're already done, right? Because, oh, I guess we have, there's one more thing to prove. Uh, so we have that 
be restricted to L gamma as the canonical trace. We have that phi of xt is equal to phi of tx. Well, let me be a bit more explicit. So we have that phi of lambda gamma uh, t lambda gamma inverse is equal to phi of t. And this is for all t and b of L2 and gamma and gamma. And so therefore, of course, replacing t with t times lambda gamma, we get that therefore v of lambda gamma t is equal to v of t lambda gamma. And again, this is for all t and all gamma. And now, of course, this formula is better than the one above it because this formula is linear in, in terms of taking combinations of gamma, whereas the one by conjugation is not linear. So therefore, we get that phi of xt is equal to phi of tx. And this is for all t and v of L2 of gamma and x in the group algebra c of gamma. So it's almost a hypertrace at this point. The only thing we have to do is we have to get, here we have for x in the group algebra. And for the hypertrace, we needed x M, the von Neumann algebra. Uh, but actually, once you have it on the group algebra, you have it on the von Neumann algebra, and that's because it restricts to the trace. So specifically, what you can do is do Cauchy-Schwartz. Um, so note, if we have x in the group von Neumann algebra, so we can take xn in the group algebra, such that xn converges to x say, uh, a strong operator topology. And now what we can do is then say, well, what is phi of xt minus phi of xn t? Well, even though the state is not normal, so the state is not normal, um, so you wouldn't get right away that this converges to zero, but what you can do is you can do the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So say that this is less than or equal to phi of, and now you have uh, x minus xn times x minus xn star. And now you have phi of t star t. So that's the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. And then what do you see? Well, here, now you have phi restricted, and now you have elements in the group von Neumann algebra, and, by, and we know that phi restricts to the canonical trace there, which is normal. So phi is not normal in all of B of L2, but it is normal on L gamma. And here you have this, the, exactly that this is converges to zero strong operator topology. Uh, I guess maybe you need strong operator topology and uh, Xn uniformly bounded. Maybe you need Kaplansky's. Because uh, then you get that this is converges strong operator topology to zero. And of course, the second thing is fixed. So you get that this converges to zero. And you similarly get, similarly, phi of Tx minus phi of Txn goes to zero. And so there you get, therefore you get that phi of xt minus phi of tx is the limit as n goes to infinity of phi of xnt minus phi of txn. And now these are in the group algebra, and so this is just the constant zero sequence here. So, uh, so the fact that the state restricted to a normal state on the group algebra and the fact, so that allows us to show that this hypertrace property actually extends from the group algebra to the whole group von Neumann algebra. All right, so that proves one direction. Now we need to prove the other direction. Uh, let's see, so now we need to prove this direction. That is, if the group von Neumann algebra is amenable, so if there's a hyper uh, trace, then the group is amenable. And this we do it exactly the same way as, as we did last time, um, showing that if you had a one-dimensional representation, it's, it's the, the same thing. So if 
B is a hypertrace for L gamma, meaning it's a state on B of L2, uh, which satisfies this hypertrace property. So then again, we have a natural embedding of L infinity of gamma into B of L2, and we just restrict a trace there, and I claim that this is an invariant mean. Um, so, no, so then B restricted to L infinity of gamma is a state. And if, say, S is in gamma and F is an L infinity of gamma. So then B of S times F. Well, remember how F was embedded. So we did this argument on Friday. So that's why I'm not, you know, being quite as um, pedantic as I was then. Uh, so the action of F, the action of gamma on L infinity when it's inside of B of L2 is just conjugation by the left regular. So this is exactly phi of uh, left regular L gamma F lambda S star. And now lambda S is of course in the group von Neumann algebra, so you can use the hypertrace property and say that this is just V of F. So this is an invariant state when you just restrict it here. All right, so that finishes that direction, that direction. All right, any questions about that? All right, so I think that's all I wanted to say about amenability. Uh, although notice that, uh, so, uh, you know, this fairly simple argument, uh, already you have a rigorous proof that say that they're, you know, free group factors are not isomorphic to the hyperfinite to one factor, for instance, uh, which, is, which is kind of nice. So the original proof of Murray and von Neumann goes through property gamma, which is also not complicated. Um, but either way, okay. Uh, yeah, so that's all I want to say about amenability. And now I want to move on to property T. So property T is the extreme opposite uh, end of the spectrum of amenability. So it's not an approximation property at all, but rather it's a rigidity property. So I guess non-property T would be uh, the more approximation property. So what is property T? Uh, well, I already defined, remember the notion of invariant vectors. So property T just says that the only time you have inv almost invariant vectors in a representation is when you actually have invariant vectors. So you have the trivial representation inside. So here's the definition. This is due to Kajdan. Uh, that gamma has property T. Actually, let me do a little bit of a generalization to make life easier. So this would be due to Kajdan, and then the relative version was introduced by Magulis. So that is that here we have if sigma is a subgroup of gamma. So then the pair gamma sigma has relative property T. If uh, whenever pi is a representation of gamma, unitary representation, and uh, whenever this has almost invariant vectors, So I defined this before. Remember, this just means there's a net of unit vectors which become more and more invariant under more and more elements uh, for the group. Uh, and if whenever you have an almost invariant vector, then there is a genuine invariant vector for the subgroup. So then there is a non-zero uh, sigma invariant vector. Okay. 
So that's the definition. And then we'll say that gamma has property T if the pair gamma gamma has relative T. So gamma has property T if pair gamma gamma has relative T. Okay. Um, so of course, amenable groups, uh, they were one of the equivalent characterizations we saw is that the left regular representation has almost invariant vectors. So if you have amenable groups that are also have property T, then you have that the left regular representation has invariant vectors. And you can see that that's pretty, uh, pretty easy to see that's if and only if the, of course, the invariant vectors will be constant. And if they're in L2, then that implies that the constant functions in L2 are in L2, which means your group is finite. So we have that uh, note that if gamma is amenable and has T, then gamma is finite. Uh, okay, so infinite amenable groups is not the place to look for for property T. Uh, also, another example, so we saw that free groups were the canonical example of non-amenable groups, uh, but free groups also do not have property T. One way to see this is that, um, uh, yeah, so one way to see this is as follows. So write this as a lemma, maybe this is in Kaj John's original paper. And that is that if uh, gamma surjects onto some lambda and gamma has T, so then lambda has T. So quotients of property T groups again have property T, uh, which means in particular if uh, F2 had property T, then any quotient of it would have property T, mainly Z2, but Z2 is an infinite amenable group. So, uh, so free, group, free groups don't have T, definitely don't have T. Um, in some sense, free groups are even uh, further away than amenable groups from, from property T. All right, so that's one example. Uh, another remark, so another lemma that if gamma has T, so then gamma is finitely generated. Um, Oh yeah, so of course one corollary of the above is that also gamma has finite abelianization because of course the abelianization is a quotient which is an abelian group hence amenable, so it must be finite. Uh, and now here we see that also if gamma has property T then it's finitely generated. Uh, here's a quick proof of that. Uh, here's a standard way to do it. Uh, so we uh, enumerate, well, for each uh, finitely generated subgroup, sigma and gamma, we consider uh, let's see, this is not what I want to do. For each finite subset, for each finite subset at gamma. Consider the representation L2, and now we have gamma mod the subgroup generated by F, and we have the left regular rep or the quasi regular representation of gamma on this that extends just set multiplication from the left. So this is a perfectly nice uh, representation. And now we can consider the direct sum. So next consider set uh, H to be the direct sum over all F of this quasi-regular representation. 
So I have finite subgroups of gamma. And then what can we see about this? Well, we see that by construction, uh, so of course note that the Dirac function on the subgroup itself is invariant under the subgroup generated by it. Um, so therefore, for any finite number of elements, there is a vector in this representation which is actually invariant under those finitely set up elements. So therefore, this representation has almost invariant vectors. So property T says that this representation has non-zero invariant vectors. And then, of course, projecting this non-zero, so property T implies H has a non-zero uh, gamma invariant uh, vector. But of course, then we could project this vector down to each one of these copies of the quasi-regular representations. And if it was zero on each projection, then the vector would be zero. So it can't be zero on each projection. So therefore, there has to exist one of these which has an invariant vector. Uh, projecting then gives a gamma invariant vector some uh, L2 of gamma mod. But just like we did before with the left regular representation, if a quasi-regular representation has an almost invariant vector, then that means the constant functions there have to be L2. Uh, so you get that this, uh, this subgroup has to have finite index. So this implies that this subgroup uh, has finite index. Which of course implies that gamma is finitely generated. Because if you have a finitely indexed subgroup, a finite index subgroup which is finitely generated, then you're finitely generated yourself. Okay, so this is, uh, so what Kajdan was interested in these original two properties and what Kajdan showed is that uh, higher rank simple Lie groups uh, and their lattices all have property T. And so therefore lattices and higher rank simple Lie groups satisfy these two properties. That was the question that Kajdan answered at, during his publication. So we won't uh, prove that much in depth, but I do wanna give you one uh, classical example of property T, and that is that um, SLNZ has T for N greater than or equal to three. So I want to prove prove this. Uh, before we prove that, I'm so I, for this I'm going to use the strategy. Uh, I guess this is showing first showing relative property T, which I believe was Margulis who noticed that Kajdan can do this. And, uh, and then I'll use a, an argument of Shalom going from relative property T to property T for these. So this won't go through the Lie group. Kajdan's proof uh, went through the Lie group. We'll, we'll give a direct proof. Uh, so in order to do a direct proof, we first, uh, the first step will be to show that this pair Zn, um, SLNZ, Zn has relative T. And this is for N greater than or equal to two. So two works as well for this, for this case. And then the second step will be that for SLNZ, it has lots and lots of copies. Uh, oh, what did I do? How is Zn embedded in here? I meant to write semi-direct product. So this acting on Zn. So, yeah. so this semi-direct product where this actions each usual matrix multiplication. Uh, so this has relative property T. And now like SL3Z has many, has natural copies of SL2Z 
uh, semi-direct product z squared and using using these this copies of relative t is how you get property t so to do that we're going to first study relative property t for just general semi-direct products uh, so here's one characterization or consequence of relative t for semi-direct products all right Uh, and to do that, I'll need one more tool from, uh, from operator theory. I'll, I'll need the spectral theorem. So specifically, um, recall that if, if A is an abelian group, and pi is a representation, so then, well, of course, pi gives a representation of the full group C star algebra. Abelian groups are amenable, so we know that the full group is the same as the reduced group C star algebra. And the reduced group C star algebra is, is uh, you have Fourier transformation, which gives you an isomorphism between that C star algebra and continuous functions on the dual. Uh, so if pi is a representation, uh, then, we get a representation of the reduced group C star algebra of A, which by Fourier transform is isomorphic to continuous functions on the dual group. So A here is an abelian discrete group. So the dual group will be a compact group. So A at, of course here, continuous functions, we don't care about the group structure, just that it's a compact space. Uh, so we have this canonical identif identification, and then we get a representation of continuous functions on a compact space, and then we have the spectral theorem for that. So if you like, uh, therefore there exists a spectral measure Uh, on on a hat giving this representation or if you're maybe a little uncomfortable with spectral measures maybe you're not used to working with spectral measures uh, so what I mean by that is ie for any univector C and H there is a probability measure mu sub c, and this is probability measure on a hat. And this is such that um, we have that uh, pi a c c, take this inner product, and this is going to exactly be the integral of pi a. Uh, maybe I shouldn't use a since, oh no, a is fine. Um, so this will be the integral of pi a with respect to this measure on the probability space of the dual group. So in other words, this is going to be exactly the integral of the pairing a chi d mu c of chi. And this is, so this is the pairing between A and its dual group, uh, chi. Chi is the space of characters of A. All right, so this is the, um, whenever you have an abelian group and you have a representation, this is representation theory of abelian groups. And that's the situation we're going to have over here because we're going to have a semi-direct product, and so then we're going to have an abelian group. And this is how we're going to do it. And so now you can give a proposition. So here's the proposition. So if uh, a group lambda acts on A, so by automorphisms, and say gamma is the cross product, the semi-direct product, so again here A abelian, 
Uh, so then the pair gamma A has relative property T if and only if there does not exist uh, a net new I of probability measures on the dual group such that uh, two things happen. Uh, one is that new I of the singleton at the identity should be equal to zero. So we'll see that this translates as there exists no invariant vectors. Uh, the other is that nu i converges to the Dirac function at the identity uh, weak star. So we'll see that that means that there exists almost invariant vectors. And then the third thing we need is that they're almost invariant vectors. So that means there's almost invariant vectors for A. We also need that they're almost invariant vectors for lambda. And that's going to turn into the condition that uh, T nu i minus nu i uh, goes to zero. And this is for all T and lambda, where the action on the space of probability. So lambda acts on A, so therefore it naturally acts on its dual group. And so it naturally acts on the space of probability measures here. So this is the proposition. And for the proof, see I'm running out of time a little bit here, but that's OK. Uh, but the proof is, is basically going to come down to um, just reinterpreting. So the proof is just the spectral theorem, uh, essentially. It's just reinterpreting what does a representation mean with and when does it have almost invariant vectors? When does it have invariant vectors? And then taking, so the proof is um, uh, as follows. So this, this norm is the one norm, right? In the third condition? Uh, this norm is the uh, probability, the norm in the space of probabilities. So if you like the norm of the states, you mean the states. Oh, okay. okay. Or the supremum over you know, the usual norm on the space of measures. Uh, so the, I mean, the probability measures on the dual group, which is a compact space. So it's not, not they, these aren't L1 functions. Right, 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 right. Uh, so the proof is that if pi has almost invariant vectors, say Cn, So then we saw before that each Cn gives us this measure on the dual group. So then this mu Cn um, satisfies that pi of A C C C N C N is exactly equal to A pi uh, mu N. That's the, what comes from the spectral theorem. Um, and then what do we know? We know that this on the left here uh, converges to one. So therefore this on the right converges to one for every A, but the elements of A, uh, when we view them as functions on the dual group, they separate points. And this exactly says that, uh, so the fact that this, uh, if they're almost invariant, this goes to one, and that exactly applies condition two, that these new i's go to the Dirac function at the identity weak star. Because the span of a's, um, the span of a's gives you a dense subset of, of continuous functions. They separate points. Uh, so that, that exactly gives you condition two. Uh, but you also have condition three, because if you look at what is uh, this norm T nu uh, I, well, I guess nu is mu Cn in my notation, T mu Cn minus mu Cn. And again, so this is the supremum over all continuous functions on uh, so supreme over F and continuous functions on A hat. 
of the integral, absolute value of the integral of f, and then you have d g mu cn minus mu cn. Uh, but of course, the L1 functions on A are dense in the C star algebra of continuous functions on A hat. So it's enough to put L1 functions on A. And when you put L1 functions on A, then you can also approximate by just uh, in the L1 norm by things in the group algebra. And then you see that it actually boils down to exactly the fact that uh, T is almost invariant, that C is almost in almost uh, fixed by t. Uh, maybe for the sake of time, I won't do that since I'm already five minutes over. Uh, but anyway, so if you have almost invariant vectors, you get two and three. But on the other hand, if you have number one, then that exactly says that if you like the, the if you're used to working with spectral measures, uh, the spectral measure at the identity is exactly the space of fixed, fixed vectors. So the fact that uh, the fact that there are no invariant vectors exact, exactly tells you this, right? This says the constant is not uh, you know, uh, yeah. This is if this is non-zero, then it says that the projection to the space of fixed vectors is non-zero, which which it can't be. Um, so therefore, what am I saying? If gamma has almost invariant vectors but no invariant vector, then we produce the sequence of new i's. And conversely, if there exists a sequence of new i's, well then the, for each new i, um, uh, for each new i, we get an L2 representation, but I guess it won't necessarily be quasi invariant, but you can make a quasi invariant by taking a convex or by taking some combination of these two new eyes. Um, yeah, maybe, of course, the converse is also not important for us, but, um, but you can prove the converse, but I won't go into any more details. Instead, I just want to list this corollary and this is what we're actually going to need. So the corollary doesn't use the converse. And that is that if, this pair gamma A does not have relative property T. So then uh, there exists a finitely additive uh, probability measure Let's call it M on the space of Borel subsets of the dual group such that it gives measure zero to the identity element uh, and is gamma invariant. Uh, lambda invariant. Um, uh, but one more condition and such that M of O, uh, maybe not use O, that looks a little difficult, M of E is equal to one for every open neighborhood of. So uh, what it says, and this follows directly from the previous proposition, because you take these mu i's, so the proof of this, you just let m be any uh, weak star accumulation point in, of these new eyes. And these new eyes were probability measures on A 
So we view these as uh, states on uh, the space B infinity Borel infinity of A. So we view these mu i's, they're probability measures on a hat. So we view them as states on, uh, as on bounded Borel functions on a hat. And then we just take some, this is a, a perfectly nice C star algebra. And we take a weak star accumulation point of these. Uh, and that gives a state on this C star algebra. And of course, restricting the characteristic functions gives us this uh, finally added a probability measure. The fact that it gives weight zero to the identity is just because each new i does, but the fact that it gives weight one to every open neighborhood of the identity is because mu i's, so mu i's converge to the Dirac function weak star, which means that for any open neighborhood of the identity, they're going to get converge to one, right? So therefore, in the limit, you get this m. Uh, and the fact that it will be lambda invariant is because the new i's are asymptotically lambda invariant. So this is the this is the key property which we'll use. And the nice thing about this formulation is this means that if you want to show you do have relative property t, then it's like uh, just like with a non-amenability, it's you just have to find some sort of paradoxical decomposition, just like how we showed free groups were not amenable. And so that's what we'll do on Wednesday is we'll show that the action of SL2Z on Z squared has a paradoxical decomposition which prevents the existence of such a measure. Okay, any questions? All right, fantastic. We're moving along at quite a brisk pace, so I'm happy with that. Uh, I will see you guys all on Wednesday.